Hey guys, welcome to the My Sugar Free Journey podcast. I am joined today by Frederick Lebois. And um, just by way of background, we're going to get into his background a little bit here, but he studied, at, after having studied bioengineering sciences at Ghent University, he obtained a PhD in applied biological sciences at the Free University in Brussels in 2002, where he continued his academic career at the Research Group of Industrial Microbiology and Food uh, Biotechnology. Um, as a postdoctorate fellow at the Research Foundation Flanders. And uh, since 2008, he holds a professorship in the field of food science and biotechnology. And uh, Dr. Leroy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, I, so I guess I, I first um, encountered you, I'm gonna say on Twitter, I believe, because um, that may or may, not, <laughs> I may have heard you on another podcast. I don't know, it's been so long now. But the, um, the, the I have more more than passing interest in where our food comes from, what it takes to be uh, the most nutrient dense, what how it um, how what we grow and what we eat affects the environment. I mean, these are all things I think are very very pressing issues. I mean, I'm recording this. Um, we're recording this in August, uh, at the end of August, uh, and the Amazon has has caught fire and. The, the narrative that keeps coming out is this is because we eat meat. We eat meat and we set the Amazon on fire. What are we doing? You know, we're going to run the environment. So, the, you know, these narratives are out there that uh, basically it's, it's, our love of, it's our love of certain foods, meat in particular, that's causing, you know, global devastation and, and global warming. And, you know, the ice cubes are melting, the ice, icebergs are melting, and it's all, you know, it's just the whole world is going downhill. And I think that you have a slightly different <laughs> a take on, on, uh, on what's going on in the world. So um, I think before we get into that, I kind of hit the high points of your, of, your, uh, of your background. Can you give us a little bit about how you got here? What, what, is, you know, what did your research look like? And then how did you get to the point where you really wanted to study you know, uh, agriculture and, and ranching and things like that? Okay. So I'm, I'm trained in uh, bioengineering sciences. So I'm a bioengineer. Okay. And within the bioengineering um, department, you could uh, pick a direction which was, or in, or which was more or less going into chemistry and so on. And then within that one, you had food sciences. So I became a food engineer. And um, I did a PhD on food microbiology and using mathematical models to describe microbes within food. So I've been always, in, always been interested in food as such. And food is, I think, is one of the most fascinating things for human beings because we need it, first of all, but it's also so much more than just the nutrients we're taking. It is, um, it is a way of communication, basically. It's, it's, it defines our lifestyles. What I eat is something that I'm not only eating because I like it, but it's also because I want to show something to other people. Um, you build an identity around food, and I think that's very important. <clears throat> and starting from my very technical background, I became interested in how food functions within a society. So basically, originally I was looking into how bacteria or bacterial communities develop within food. And I took it a level higher where I look at how food develops or, or functions within human communities, which is equally fascinating. And, uh, I, and at the very moment, I'm trying to organize my scientific career around those two topics. So what's happening in the food on a bacterial community level and what's happening with the food in human communities. So that's interesting. So let's, let's stick with the, with the, um, well, I guess we'd go with either one of those. Are there things that we need to be concerned about when, when we're talking about our food supply and the, the micro, you know, bacterial, the, you know, the microorganisms on there, obviously, you know, I'm, we're in America, yeah. we've got a whole branch of the government that's just devoted to inspecting food. And, you know, it seems like we're doing a pretty good job. I've been eating food my entire life. I don't think I've ever gotten sick maybe once who knows. Um, what do you see maybe on the horizon, things that we need to be concerned about? Well, it is, it is important how we develop our relationship with food, and that includes also food safety, because food safety is a source of anxiety. And we are very much 
in a in a safe operating space at the moment. Our food is very much controlled. We have all kinds of inspections, um, so we we're safer than we ever before. That being said, of course, we have globalization and we have all kinds of new challenges that may appear. And those have to do with the way we produce food nowadays. So it is not always about the acute food safety issues of, let's say, salmonella, you will find it in your, in your food. It's also how, um, how food chains become vulnerable to biohazards. You see it with the African swine fever, for instance, or those kind of things. So the way we deal with food is a source of anxiety. Uh, there's some differences which are very cultural also that even between the United States and Europe uh, take for instance uh, one the field of my expertise which is um, meat fermentation you know the, the way you ferment meat we have been doing that in Europe since ever and um, we're much less strict on the biosafety on, on the biological on the microbiological criteria than you're in the States you would have to heat your product at the end of the production to be sure there's nothing left, no listeria, no, no hazards. In Europe, we're a bit more easygoing on that. And yeah, no, eggs especially. Like the, the, the way eggs come to, come to market is totally different in the States as opposed to, to, mm -hmm. as opposed to, uh, to Europe. Yeah. So this, at some point, some point, you would have to make a compromise between how much risk you tolerate and how much you can allow you make space for certain food ways right because you can you can sterilize everything you can you can make everything perfectly sterilized but then you lose so many other things we had the discussion for instance with the french raw milk cheeses they can be a source of, they can be a risk but the risk is very much under control and sometimes something will go wrong but you will enjoy a part of your heritage with those cheeses right so you can right. you can sterilize every cheese you have and try to minimize all risks but then you give up on other things um, so it's, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting paradigm how people deal with bacterial hazards or microbial hazards in general. Yeah, I was watching a, uh, 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 a documentary, for Michael Pollan did it, and uh, he was, um, it, one of the things he was, he was documenting was a, uh, a God, I can't even remember where it was, but it was a cheese factory that wanted to use old barrels to ferment, to ferment the, the dairy. And the uh, the government said no. You're not. You got to use stainless steel. It's got to be easy to to you know easy to clean. And they you know this. I think it was a monastery. Really had to kind of go to war with their with their government to retain the right to use their traditional processes to to grow cheese. Right. Yes. Exactly. That's it. Um, that being said, of course, we need a certain level of safety. I mean, we need to have some mechanisms in place that control for for hazards and try to manage them. But there is a certain, you know, compromise you have to make. It's, it's like people get killed by cars as well. So right. you can say we take out all the cars because people get killed from that. Some, somehow you have to find uh, your sweet spot. And, and this, this next question is, is a little off subject, but it, it, I've kind of sort of been following this story of, of bananas. So bananas are, every banana we eat is basically a clone of the other banana. And there's some fungus out there that's just wiping out whole banana groves. And I just got, heard, saw a tweet, like, I think three days ago, really, that said that they found this fungus in the States and that it's, you know, the beginning of the end for, for bananas. What's yeah. going on there? Well, it's, I cannot tell much more than what you just told me. It's, I've, seen, I've seen the story passing by. But it is, again, um, the fact that we have vulnerable systems. They can, at some point in time, something can happen. And that's valuable for every single system. So we've seen it with animals, but we also see it with plants. And it has been the case throughout history. We had plagues all over the historical yeah. timeline. So there's been of all ages. Now we have more science to deal with that, but we're not completely protected from it. So some kind of devastating plagues or, or attacks can, can be undermining part of the food production. Yes, and it will Okay, so let's let's switch over back to the Amazon uh, or just to the environment. So uh, there is this this narrative now that uh, eating meat is causing you know global devastation uh, that you know we are directly responsible for the Amazon being in flames today. What, I know that you believe something different. So what? What is the effect of ranching? What is the effect of growing, uh, you know, these large uh, herbivores on land? Does that harm the environment? You know, do we need to worry, be worried about cow farts? I mean, I mean, what's, what's going on here? 
It's, <clears throat> this is a very complex story, right? So that's, the problem with all those narratives is that they're always binary. It's always one thing is good, the other thing is bad. And they're always lumping everything within one category. So there's not just one category of livestock as such. I mean, livestock is a very heterogeneous entity with all kinds of different animals, all kinds of different production systems, different ecosystems. So you would have to use, um, you know, com the complexity of the debate. So some part of the livestock management of the livestock production will be harmful. Another part will be beneficial. Um, and clearly some things are not going well. Some things need improvement, but you can also, and you should also use livestock as part of the solution of meeting our global challenges for 2050. If we have to feed pop uh, human population, which is increasing. Uh, you cannot just drop, take out livestock. You will need the livestock right. for many reasons. So livestock has clearly its place in sustainable production systems, despite what is being said sometimes. Um, but it is it, what you see now is not so much a scientific debate. It is very much a symbolic debate, an ideological debate. And livestock is being used as a proxy for other anxieties, I would say. Uh, people like to use livestock as a symbol for or as something that can absorb a lot of anxiety um, and that's why i often define it as a scapegoat because scapegoats have been there since since uh, antiquity at least uh, where animals were sacrificed just to take our sins and, and and please the gods we still use them somehow in the same way because we tr we like to use an, those animals and just blame them you know they yeah. get all the blame and it's very convenient because we don't have to worry about all the other things we do that, or not all that much at least. Um, I've been communicating a bit and other people have been doing that as well about how, if you, if you use perspective, uh, how you see that the impact of livestock compared to many other things we do is quite, it's actually quite small, but it can be quite big as well. If, if you just, in certain regions of the world, you have very uh, improductive, inefficient herds that are indeed emitting a lot of methane without bringing in a lot of food. If you uh, look at sub-Sahara Africa or India, you will see that you will have a lot of, especially in India, you have those idle cows, as they say, the, the sacred cows. So they're, they're not well managed, they're, they're prone to disease, they emit their, their methane and they don't bring in a lot of food. Uh, that's a very different story than if you would have uh, regenerative grazing and, and, and grass-based cattle that just build topsoil and where you have sinking of carbon next to the emissions so that compensates. So those things are very different situations. And, and what happens now is that we just put them in one box and we say, yeah. livestock is bad. Uh, yeah, I, I had never really thought about the cows in India being not managed. Um, so that brings in all kinds of problems. I always thought, man, these people in India, they, <laughs> you know, they, they look like they could use some nutrition and uh, they've got these huge piles of nutrition just wandering around the, uh, their, their whole country. But I didn't, I didn't think about them. They're more susceptible to disease. Uh, you know, they're, we're not, they're not getting any of the benefits from their, from their agriculture, from, from their livestock. Uh, and um, they're getting all the harm, <laughs> basically. That's, a, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, so what about... <clears throat> What about when we're talking about, say, global warming specifically? Um, I, there's been a lot said about uh, when we're talking about carbon emissions that uh, that ranching and, and uh, the, these uh, livestock things are responsible for putting a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. They're not responsible for putting any carbon back into the planet um, and the uh, or back into the soil, back you know out of the atmosphere where where it could uh, do less harm. And um, this idea that, you know, that meat is directly leading to, to all the things that we know now are, are leading to, to global warming. What, what is it about, say, regenerative farming that is able to get, that is able to, to combat these global warming uh, issues? But there's some, there's some nice work by some scientists, such as um, Jason Roundtree, for instance, Who's, um, who's using, or, or most people are using cattle just to um, find a balance between uh, how they getting grass for, for uh, their own sustenance and how that taking of grass 
is in relation with the soil. So if you if you have your herds and you manage them well, because the whole idea is here to manage those herds in 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 a, in a clever way. So you will just move them around. They will take the grass, but at the same time they will fertilize the grass uh, with the manure and the way they they um, they work the soil. And that will can, that can have beneficial uh, effects. It will. Um, construct soil basically it will construct topsoil if you do that properly um, there's there's some there's some nice work that shows that if you in some specific cases because it's again it depends a lot on the soil you have and it depends on on the area you're working in uh, but you can actually get to net negative effects where you put more in the soil than you will emit that's not always working uh, to the same degree but it can be done in some places but at least what you could do is is try to consider those effects when uh, carbon budgets are being made, which nowadays is not always done, uh, far from that. They often assume it is an equilibrium with the soil, but it's not true. If you, in many pastoral systems especially, you can actually build soil and you just put carbon in the, in the ground. Is uh, the, the way that we do it in, this, in the States is, you know, the last probably quarter of a, of a cow's life, most, most of them mm-hmm. end up in these CAFOs and these large feeding operations, is that, uh, what what if, what effect of uh, of those CAFOs is there on the environment? Well, it's it's I'm not all that familiar with the CAFO system because we hardly have it in Europe, of course. I know it is it's uh, if you look at it from a, from an emission point of view, you can basically become more efficient and have less emissions. Uh, but on the other hand, it has its it has other issues. So it's uh, I think we we, we again easily assume that CAFOs are always bad. Uh, I wouldn't go that far. I, I wouldn't say it's my preferred system, but I'm convinced that there can also be CAFO systems that are more beneficial than others. Uh, if they're not all going to be like the ones they show in the vegan movies. Um, it, it's, uh, I, I prefer to see all the cows on grass because right. that's, that's the point there is that they use feed that is for human beings, just useless. Um, so they convert the grass in nutrition and there is no feed food competition at all. But um, there is a part also of what is being fed to, to cows beyond grass is also uh, waste or side streams from crops that again, we cannot, we cannot eat. So there are always balances and compromises to be made. So I wouldn't again see it too binary but I do favor as much as possible, we should as much as possible try to reduce feed food competition. I would say that would make sense because cows in, basically they are just so perfect at converting the cellulose to, to, to nutrition. Uh, so we should use that in, in, an, in, a, in the best possible way. But there are always constraints and you have to work within constraints, I guess. Are there differences in the... Um, um well, I'm thinking like since you're a microbiologist, are there differences in, in the microbiology of a, of a grass-fed cow versus a, a CAFO-fed cow? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, of course, because the micro, you bring in, it, so you have the stomachs of the cow and you bring in substrates. And depending on substrates, you see, also see that we're human beings. If you give them different substrates, you get different microbes. Different microbes mean that they will have different metabolisms and that will end up in different gas production, different short chain fatty acids. So that will create all kinds of different effects. Yes. You clearly will have uh, differences uh, also in pH level and so on, which has all kinds of repercussions. Yes. Can we introduce different microorganisms to, to cow stomachs to get them to produce different, you know, different quality meat, different quality, you know, dairy, things like that. Yeah, we've been trying to do that with humans, you know, with the probiotic uh, strategies. Uh, it's not always bringing all that much of a benefit. It depends a bit on uh, interpersonal differences. Some people seem to react a bit better than others. With other people, it doesn't have any effect. Some people seem to react a bit. It's, it's, um, it's difficult because you have so much complexity when, within microbial um, consortia in gut systems. Uh, that if you introduce like one microbe, it will have to establish itself and it's not always an easy thing. Uh, so it's, it's very difficult in humans. It, I would say it's probably even more difficult in cows. Hmm. 
Yeah, some I you know I've been following some of the uh, like fecal transplant work that's being done, and uh, it seems it seems crazy to me that because when you're doing a fecal transplant, you're transplanting at the you know the end of the line basically, and yet for some people that seems to have a huge huge impact on their overall health. Um, is there anything you can tell us about that? It, it, well, it seems to work, especially in desperate cases, uh, yes, sometimes, yeah. uh, where it often has very good effects. And basically, it is, it's not just like a probability that you'll have to introduce through the mouth and has to pass the whole, whole gut system and end up at the right place and do its job there. You basically flush out the rest and you just introduce a new, a new community from a healthy person. And in many cases, that seems to have a good effect if you want to get rid of certain harmful clostridial populations in your gut. Uh, it is a very promising strategy. It is a bit controversial, more because of the nature of it, I think, than of the actual system. Um, it, what is a bit worrying is that sometimes it's being presented as a silver bullet uh, remedy again to, for instance, treat uh, obesity, because there are some ideas that if you replace the microbes in your gut, you will get a non-obesogenic community. And people start to reflect on that, which is again, you know, an approach that I would consider us as very uh, beneficial in the long term because it's, it's too reductionist and it can have some yeah, unpredictable effects. Uh, right. So it can be used in all kinds of ways, but I would say in pathological conditions where there's a really a desperate situation, fecal transplantations are, are maybe a good option sometimes. Yes. It's interesting. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the whole st the gut microbiome and all this stuff, it's, it's so new and it seems to be so exciting. Um, you know, who knows where this is all going to be in, in 10 years. Uh, and it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to know where it is now, to be honest with you. I, I mean, I've, I try to read as much of it as I can. And, and uh, you know, it's C. diff is good. And then the next day is something else is bad. And, oh, you need to have a certain percentage of, of this to this. And it's like, oh, really? it's, it seems to just be, you know, you're kind of on your own. You need to figure out what's, what works for you. And, you know, it's hard to do because you don't know what's actually inside of you and what, what the percentages yeah. are. It's, it's, it is, it is challenging. Um, yes. And, and it's um, we're just trying at this moment, we're trying to map somehow which communities correspond with which states of health and disease right. and to correlate those, but we don't get beyond the correlation. Right. Uh, we don't know if the microbes shift because of a certain condition or, or the other way around. But what we do know is that certain um, inflammatory effects can, can originate, but that may have to do with, you know, how leaky your gut is and how much those microbes interact with the rest of your body. So it's very, very complicated. And it's, we're, often we are again trapped in this very reductionist binary views of, of good and bad bacteria. It doesn't work like that. It's exactly. not just good versus bad bacteria. It's very much complex. You, you, you can have one type, even the Shrisha coli, for instance, which is considered to be a bad one, while it can be beneficial in certain circumstances with specific strains and specific people. So it's all very, very difficult and very complex. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. It is, is incredibly complex. Um, that, what about the what about the idea? I mean, we know that when you change your diet to a more ancestral diet, where you you got a lot more meat, you have less sugar, you have less grains, that we know that that does two things seemingly at the same time. You you most people, especially the the morbidly obese people, tend to lose weight pretty rapidly, and it also adjusts their gut microbiome. How? I mean, in my community, we, we tend to, we tend to blame insulin. You know, it's the insulin that's, that's, you know, that's causing the weight gain. If you lower your insulin, you lose weight, but there's, I mean, that gut microbiome has to, has to have some role to play. Um, how has there been any work done trying to tease out the difference between just a drop in insulin versus a drop in insulin and an adjustment in gut microbiome, what role it has on, on, uh, on uh, weight loss, is there a way to do that? Uh, you know, what what do we need to know in, about that? Well, it's in its infancy, I would say. We we know that L, that uh, LPS from the bacteria, for instance, is inflammatory and can, if if your body is a in a, in a broken state, that LPS can can make things worse. Um, and it really cross communicates. Uh, there are lots of cascades that go all the way through your body, and that can connect to what's in in the gut. 
uh, especially if, if the gates are open, <laughs> if the, the gates are opening, then, then you will have this cross communication and that can be right. harmful. Uh, there are also some strategies where people use specific bacteria uh, that produce specific compounds such as uh, propionic acid, for instance, that would then interfere with um, metabolism, but also with appetite and, and then they're developing ideas around probiotics to deal with uh, overweight. So there are all kinds of ideas that circulate, but that are pretty much in their infancy. We know, me we know the mechanisms, but we don't know so much how to control all of that in our favor. That's, that's the difficult part. How can you, how can you get the grip on that? Um, I, I would say that the, that the main thing would be to have a healthy body before you start thinking about the microbes because you can try to fix the microbes, but if the body is in a broken state, you will not get very far, I'm afraid. Um, and that, that will be key. And that, you know, the, it's, it's so much easier to try to affect your health from the outside in than it is to go from the inside out. You try to, you know, adjust your microbiomes and stuff. Maybe you just work on the things that you can work on, like what you eat and, and how you move and yeah. how much sleep you get, how much stress you have. And, and, uh, and then maybe let the microbiome, uh, take care of itself. Although I sure wish that there was a way, especially for, especially for people who are new to say a low carb diet, if there was an easy way to track changes in their microbiome over, over a year, you know, um, the uh, continuous glucose monitors are, you know, the, these huge helpful tools to help people figure out what foods are doing what to their body. If there was some kind of continuous microbiome monitor that, that, that would be available. I don't know what that, what that would look like, but it would sure, it would sure uh, make things, I think a little bit easier for us. Yes. Yes. It's just very difficult to track your microbes. Uh, we know that there all kinds of things can happen. If you, if you shift your diet in, in that way, you can have different microbes producing different vitamins. You can have more folate, you can have all kinds of things, but it's very hard to, to, to monitor your microbes because you need this, uh, you know, metagenetics and sequencing uh, tools to just to map them out. And then you will still need to make conclusions based on that. It's not straightforward. You need bioinformatics and all kinds of approaches to get, to get a view on that. So, but I, I, again, I think the main challenge here is to, to have a healthy lifestyle and, and fix that layer. That's the most, that's the fundamental layer. Yeah. Okay. So, and stuff like that. Yeah. All right. So I want to switch gears a little bit. You mentioned you were also uh, curious and looking into how food affects different cultures that, you know, the actual people that, that eat them. What, what, you know, are there certain cultures that seem to be healthier uh, long term, as a you know, uh, I mean, we, we we talk a lot about blue zones. We talk a lot about uh, you know, people in Hong Kong tend to live longer than people in mainland China because of the effects of uh, mm. different effects of their diet. And uh, you know, people in India that eat a vegetarian diet tend to have these you know skyrocketing rates of type two diabetes. So obviously, food and culture go hand in hand. What what is it that you've looked into about how food is affecting different cultures and th things that we need to be aware of? Yes, well, I've, I've um, used also a, a, more, a more historical perspective, I guess, where I've looked into how our relationship to food has changed on the very long term. So starting from the hunter-gatherer situation over the Neolithic situation, um, and then how that de uh, develops um, until the industrial revolution takes place. And then you will have what we see today, which is almost a post-industrial kind of society. And the way we look at food has changed, uh, I would say, of course, in chunks, you know, and, and it has been typifying our worldview. So changes in diet basically are a, um, a proxy for what's changing in a society. So the way that people behave around their diet shows what's going on in the society. And, and that is, that's fascinating. And you can look at uh, hunter-gatherers, which have this very specific circular ideas where food is part of, of the whole cosmic interrelationship. They will hunt, but then those animals are uh, not being seen as resources that much. They're being seen as almost as equals and the people and they will negotiate with them and they will be part of a transaction and everything will be done very respectfully. And that changed a lot over, over history. Uh, the Neolithic came in where the, where the view changed towards more, uh, uh, you could call that dominion, you could call that maybe 
uh, a different level. So the equal level changes a bit and people come, especially with animals, they, 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 uh, the sacrifice is introduced. So the, the animals are sacrificed to the gods. So it's still very respectful in a way, but it's, it's a very religious framework and people eat less meat at that point. It's something that is, uh, it becomes very valuable when you share it. Um, because it's it's connected to festivities and and it gets this other specific ceremonial role, uh, which is very interesting. It had it with the hunter gatherers and even even more maybe, but in a different way. And then you, if you follow the historical line, we don't have time to talk about all the different little steps in there. But at some point in time, you get into the 19th century, and then you have a very drastic change because the food chain gets completely restructured. You get industrial productions, you get urban demand, the, the cities develop, people get purchasing power, they want uh, quality food, and then there has to be supplied. And uh, what happens with the animals at that point is that they are um, moved out of the cities. Um, before they were in the city, they were being slaughtered in the cities, they were, so you, the people were exposed to it. And at some point in time, the animals had to disappear because you had a new, um, spirit, right? You had you, people wanted clean city. The bourgeois mentality right. came, and people wanted clean cities. Um, food, food had a different, a different function suddenly. Uh, animals were uh, out of sight. Uh, slaughter was completely out of sight at some point, and then, and that's that's part of what we're seeing today. It becomes very problematic because we're not used to it anymore, and when we see it, we get shocked, right? Right. Um, and and then you have what is happening today, which is again, fundamentally different because people are very much lost. We have outsourced all of our uh, food production to a very small group of people. And we have not such a good understanding of what is going on mm -hmm. during that production. And this disconnect is responsible for a lot of the problems we're seeing today, I would say. The way we are disrupted, the way the whole thing has been disrupted is due for a large part because people have lost the ability to understand food and where it comes from, agriculture, right. and even how you cook it. It's, uh, it's difficult for some people to, nowadays to cook food. Not everybody is still capable of going into a kitchen with a certain amount of primary materials and make a dish out of that. And then what is probably equally important is to share that dish with other people. How, how do you still do that? Because what happens a lot now, now is that you have a family with, let's say, two parents and, and a couple of kids, and then you have people coming in at different times of the day. Uh, they will have, they will grab some kind of dish from the fridge, throw it in the microwave, eat at separate times, and be hardly involved in, the, or have no notion anymore of how food was used in the, the different systems before that whether it will be hunter-gatherers or, or, or Neolithic societies or medieval societies or, or the ones from, uh, from, from the 17th century. It's a very different situation. And it is responsible for a lot of damage, I think, uh, both for public health, but also for societal interaction. And that is, that, that is I think, the, the fascinating, that's what, what attracts me in the, whole, in, in the whole field, is that I would like to understand how the system can be fixed by learning from where food, what food has meant for us and how it has changed. And this is where, again, history is, is, is the thing that can instruct us. Um, it will also make us more engaged with, with the food chain. If we understand that history, if we start to cherish what it meant once upon a time. So in, um, there's a story in Jewish tradition, uh, not, it's not a story. It's you know, the, the Passover, mm -hmm. um, their, their holiday. One of the things they had to do is, uh, the Jews had to bring a lamb into their household with them and raise it as a pet. So the, the kids would play with it. They would name it. They would become attached to it. And then when Passover came, they had to take it outside and slaughter it with the whole family watching. And then they had to eat it. And, uh, I've always thought, First of all, it seems like a brutal thing to <laughs> to put your kids through every year, but you know it, they were connected to their food. They knew what it was, you know, what it takes to to grow a lamb, what it takes right. to uh, you know to be attached to 
uh, a, uh, uh, an animal and then have that animal give its body to, uh, you know, to sustain your, your family for another couple of days. Um, it's, it's a powerful thing. That idea of negotiating with the, negotiating with the animals that you eat, I've, that doesn't happen. I, you know, I, I just had a quarter pound of hamburger meat. I have absolutely no idea what animal that came from, cool. you know, where, I mean, I don't even know what part of the world it came from. It could have come from down the street. I live in Texas. Could have come from, you know, New Zealand. It could have come from Argentina. There's, there's, there's no way to, to know anything about your food anymore unless you take a very, very hands-on, hands-on roll with it. That's, it's, it's, it's so powerful uh, to have just, I think the more, the more knowledge you have about where your food is coming from, uh, the less confusion you are, you, you have about how to, uh, you know, about, about how to eat. My wife <clears throat> has a garden. So we've got this little garden out here and it's, it's impressive to me how uh, much work she has to do to get anything to come out of that garden. Like it doesn't just happen. She's got to be out there every day. She's got to water. She's got to fertilize. She's got to, you know, check on that. I don't even know what all goes in there. She was telling me, uh, in fact, just, just before the started that she's thinking about getting some chickens because she's got grasshoppers and all these other little pests out there that, um, that are eating everything. And she wants to get some chickens to set the chickens loose on the, uh, on the garden and let them eat all the grasshoppers and, and, and it'll help, it'll help take some of the, the weight off of, of her bag, you know, to, trying, trying to get food. It's tough to get food to come out of, out of the earth. You know, it really, it really, really is. And the fact that we could do it at such scale is really impressive and such a, you know, an amazing testimony to, to what human beings are, are capable of. Um, yep. Looking kind of into the future a little bit, we are, we're about seven and a half billion people right now. We're headed towards nine. We're probably headed towards 10. We might be headed towards 12 billion. Who knows? Um, this is undoubtedly going to put more and more of a strain on our food supply. What do you think is going to happen? Are we just going to have mass starvation at some point or are we going to be able to feed everyone? Uh, are we going to have to devote more and more land and more resources to growing food? What's, what's going to happen? Yeah, well, it's, it's very difficult to predict because we don't even know how many people will be. Apparently, we're not all that sure anymore if it's going to be 9 billion or it's going to be a bit less. There's some new speculations that maybe it will stabilize a bit earlier because of more societal effects, uh, education and, and, and so on, so that may curb, the, but nobody knows. So that, that will be very important because I'm, I'm a microbiologist, so I'm, I'm trained to think in logarithmic scales. Uh, right. and, and, and a, li a little difference between, let's say, 9 billion or, or 8.5 billion is huge <laughs> on resources. So I'm basically yeah. seeing a bacterial growth curve here. <laughs> if, I, if I look at human population, we had a very long lag phase. And then suddenly it started to, to explode. And now it's, it's a bit guessing where it will occur, but we have to be prepared. And I think we need to seriously consider all options and identify the priorities. And we know the priorities. The priorities have to do with bringing in um, quality nutrition for so many people. And this is not going to be about so much carbs and so much kilocals. That's what you often see in, in those policy making scenarios where people say, well, we have so many kilocals and if we do this food, it will have so much emissions per kilocal and this food will have so much water per kilocal or per gram or per, this is not what it's about. It's about, we, we already have a serious situation at the moment where people are lacking in important micronutrients. And we're talking about things like vitamin D and, and retinol and uh, vitamin Magnesium. D and iron and zinc. And those things are going to be a major challenge. Right. So you will, you will need nutrient-dense foods. And, and um, so that's what you have to aim for. And then again, that will, that, that's one of the reasons why livestock can absolutely not be excluded from, from the equation. Um, but also you will have to deal with the largest issues and uh, things like food waste, which is enormous. Um, and uh, food supply chains and, and empowering people to get to get more involved, to have more control over their food production systems. So it's, this is policy, basically. I'm not the one here to design the policies for the future. I'm too small and too limited in my capacity to do so. But uh, I think we know a certain amount of, of 
you know, the, the, we know the constraints and where we have to look at land is going to be a major thing. The, the land use, we've seen with the IPCC report as well. So land use is going to be primordial, but we have to think very well of how we're going to apply that land um, because we cannot just grow it full of monocultures <laughs> that will just have to be fueled with chemical fertilizers and get yeah, the topsoil will deplete. That's only feasible for a certain amount of time, then you will get in trouble again. So you, you need sustainable systems, sustainable ways to deal with your land and land is complex again because land comes in all kinds of different kinds. Right. Uh, some is suitable for crops, some is not. Some can be uh, improved, some is very hard to improve. So it needs, uh, it needs the best of our, our agronomists and the best of our uh, scientists to, to work on that. Um, yeah, and we see we've seen these grand scenarios now. We see grants and we have to do this and and, and often again they're the way to reductionists. It's not about being either vegan or <laughs> being massively um carnivorous uh, carnivore oriented. It's it's about all the diff the different pattern and the mosaic of different solutions. So you need you need a mosaic of solutions. Right. And and until people start Thinking in mosaics, we will not get anywhere, I'm afraid, because there's never one system that can just be the perfect system and then you forget about all the rest. You have to integrate those, integrate plants with animals, integrate different cropping systems and, and interconnect them. It needs a lot of science and uh, you would need the best scientists combined to do so. People try to do that, but it's not always the case. There's a lot of people, a lot of think tanks that are very limited in their consortia. The people that they put around the table are, have limited expertises and they often uh, are not, or at least underestimating the value of a dialogue with, with people that know about the system in the first place. Farmers, just to them, one group of people should be included in, in the dialogue. The hand people with the experience of, of the field and that know how it works should be on the table not only the ones that design graphs based on Excel spreadsheets. You see what I mean? So yeah. that's, that's what we have to, for sure, to, to, to guarantee if we want to make progress. But it is, there are serious issues. And I would say that land use is going to be a major one. Land use, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that's definitely it. And um, is there, um, are there things that we need to be concerned about as far as weather patterns changing? You know, we talk about, uh, global warming. We talk about this increase in tornadoes and hurricanes and and the uh, and uh, sea levels rising. Uh, I would assume sea levels rising means less available land. Uh, are there things like that 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 we need to be worried about as well? We we need to be worried about how how climate change takes place. Yes, and and climate change is again a very it, it is not a linear thing. We're just temperature increases, it's, it's about all the, the, the effects you create because of that. And, and that will have repercussions, of course, yes, and should be curbed as much as possible. Um, but again, using the best science and, and that will involve much more than just thinking about the livestock herds, the, the, about the herds and, and the methane. That's not, gonna, that's not gonna be the solution. It needs more profound uh, solutions. Okay, well, um... I really appreciate you coming on. Can you tell my listeners if they want to find out more about you, where they can uh, find out, you know, follow you on social media and all that good stuff? Yeah, well, people, I, I'm not all that versed in social media except for Twitter. <laughs> I do right. like Twitter a lot. Uh, you will hardly find me on the other ones, but people can follow me on Twitter. Um, you can maybe put the Twitter handle on, on your side. I don't know. It's it's F L E R R O Y, so Fleur, Fleuroy, <laughs> 1974, so in 1974. And that's where you'll find me. And I usually tweet about many different aspects of, of the diet. Uh, it goes from the health part to the more, uh, you know, um, societal uh, things. Often it's about animal products because that's the, the part I'm most interested in. Um, so that's where I put my information mostly. Except for my scientific papers, but that's a bit more difficult to keep track of, I guess. Okay. Well, <clears throat> we're going to put links to all that in the show notes, and I'll, um, I'll maybe find your last two or three scientific papers and link them if people want to follow that. Okay. Um, or 
or just, just check, just check those out. Uh, I really appreciate coming on and, um, hopefully, um, you know, hopefully my, I, I really hope that my people listen to this and enjoy this because I want them to, um, I don't want anyone to be afraid of eating a steak, basically that there, you know, there's, there's good reason to think that, uh, good, high quality, ranching and animal agriculture is really the key to, to our future as a, as a society, as a, uh, as a planet. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys, keep listening. We'll be right back with some more information. <laughs> 